Hello everyone and welcome to Conversations with our community and today we're going to be speaking about autonomic symptoms. I'm Lara and I'm speaking to you from just outside London in the UK and my pronouns are she, her. I'm going to introduce um, everyone who is with us today. We're going to start with Larry. Hi, my name is Larry Constant and I am located outside of New Orleans, Louisiana and my pronouns are he, him. Thank you. I'm Rich. Hi, my name is Rich, Rich Bory. Uh, I'm located out of Long Island, New York, and my pronouns are he, him. Thank you. Cyan. Hi, my name is Cyan Centeno Bloom. I'm located in Maryland, just at the southern tip, and my pronouns are she, her. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to start by asking you all how and when you were diagnosed with your autonomic um, symptoms and, and what you were diagnosed with, because I think it's interesting to hear how that differs from people to people, experience to experience, um, and can also change based on where you are geographically as well, depending on what tests are offered. So Rich, how and when were you diagnosed? Uh, I believe it was, uh winter of 2009 um my symptoms had started uh back in we believe 2007 of spring um so it really took a solid two years to get a diagnosis um you know at first uh i had seen a cardiologist and ran a bunch of different tests and you know, a ton came up blank, um, back and forth between seeing the regular doctor as well. Um, and it wasn't really until like a last ditch effort of my cardiologist saying, well, we've really done everything we can. Um, and there, you know, there's one other option we can do. And that was the tilt table test, but it really took a solid two years. Um, and also I, I failed to mention um, that it also included, uh, neurologists as well. Um, and I also believe, uh, at that point in time, I probably had seen maybe an endocrinologist as well. Um, so it really was the last ditch effort from my cardiologist testing uh, me with a tilt table test, but it took me a solid two years to get a diagnosis. Yeah. Too long. <laughs> yes. And Cyan, what's your experience? So my symptoms started when I was very young, probably around eight or nine years old. Um, I unfortunately didn't get a diagnosis until within the last two years. So it was 20 something years. Um, my symptoms started with fainting. I couldn't tolerate exercise, um, lots of headaches, stomach aches, anxieties, um, and I moved around a lot. So I, I came from the US Virgin Islands and then moved to California and then moved to Maryland. So I never really had like, you know, a health care team that kept track of me because I kept moving. Um, and things really started to show after I had a surgery for endometriosis in 2019. Um, and I had complications from that surgery and developed an abscess. And that's kind of when I really worsened dramatically. Um, I started losing my ability to walk normally. My oxygen levels were dropping very low. My heart rate was skyrocketing, you know, problems with blood pressure. And um, they couldn't figure it out right away. I was going from ER to ER after my hospitalization. And then one doctor said, you know, maybe you have POTS. So I went to Johns Hopkins Hospital and they said, well, we don't really think it's POTS because you don't have, you know, you have a lot of similarities, but you have a lot of things that don't usually occur with it. So it continued, you know, it was a journey for another probably almost year. 
And I ended up seeing a pretty well-known autonomic specialist who finally diagnosed me with autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy, which is also known as autoimmune autonomic neuropathy, um, which means my immune system is attacking my autonomic nervous system and damaging parts of it. So it was a very lifelong journey to, to finally get a diagnosis. Wow. And, and like you said, it's not, I, I know from well, my personal experience and also when you see other communities, the oxygen levels aren't the usual that you see with the pot. So I imagine that also confused things, but I'm glad that you finally got there despite it taking such a long time. Larry, how about you? So <clears throat> I, let's see, I got to do the math. I should have been doing that while other people were talking. Uh, I believe I was diagnosed one year before I was diagnosed with ehlers danlos syndrome. So that would have been 2009. Um, and it was kind of random. I had been going to a lot of doctors trying to figure out what's going on. Like we all do. And one doctor noticed that I didn't sweat at all. And it was funny because I told him I used to sweat and now I don't sweat anymore. And he was like, how long? And I said about four years. So put me on a tilt table and I was out. Like as soon as they flipped it, I was unconscious. So I woke up and he said, well, you know, this is actually a good thing because now we can try and figure out what, you know, else is going on based off of this information. But at the time, there was not a ton of information linking EDS and the autonomic. So it took another year to get all that figured out. But uh, yeah, I guess it was about a four year journey trying to figure it out. But it led to me figuring out the rest of this. So, you know, I feel kind of lucky, you know? Yeah, it, I was diagnosed uh, back in 2007. And I remember I saw Professor Rodney Graham and he said, there's this new thing that we are learning about that can be seen with, with EDS and it's, you know, POTS. And it was so new and so undiscovered even amongst our own community of which I didn't really have a community then I, I hadn't really met anyone else with it so um, I remember it being it really is something that has become much more known about as the years have gone on in, in terms of certainly associated to to EDS and mine was sparked by a liver infection and often you find that POTS can be brought on from from a life event or from an infection um, and I find that interesting as well, that often you see that, that pattern uh, with people as well. But we've certainly come a long way in our understanding of, of this as it, as it is related to our community. So some of you have touched on how it impacts you day to day. It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about that. Cyan, can you tell us a little bit about your day to day with this? Um, so right from the mo mo moment that I wake up is difficult. Um, I have to, as soon as I open my eyes, I have to wait a few minutes before I sit up because then I get very, very ill. My heart rate goes up sometimes near 200 beats per minute. Um, so it's a very slow morning for me. I wake up around 530 in the morning because I know it's going to take me a while <laughs> to get situated. So once I get myself sitting up in bed, I transfer over to my electric wheelchair. The whole day is a challenge from brushing my teeth to brushing my hair. Um, I just got a home health aide to be able to help me with daily acts of living, activities of living, um, because everything is difficult. Speaking is difficult. Um, doing my hair, doing my makeup, taking a shower is probably one of the worst. I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Um, and um, even when I'm on the computer too long or doing my schoolwork, uh, that triggers my symptoms. So it's honestly like climbing the biggest mountain every day. Um, I'm constantly have nausea. My oxygen levels drop whenever they feel like dropping. Um, shortness of breath, near fainting. Eating makes me sick. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult for my husband and I, um, cause he's my caretaker and to go from having worked and driving and, you know, being very independent to now needing help with everything has been, uh, very, very difficult. I'm so sorry to hear that. Larry, how about you? Um, <clears throat> 
it's, it's, it's changed my life a lot, especially in the last two years. Uh, I went from running my own business and, and working every day to now I only do small jobs from home only. Um, the biggest thing that changed for me is that I went years never sweating. And then all of a sudden I'm drenched all the time. I'm shaking all the time because I get the cold chills from being drenched all the time, <laughs> you know? So I remember in 2019, I was on a, on a uh, show. I used to run conferences and everyone there thought that I was abusing drugs or something because I was shaking. I was drenched in sweat and I started getting all these questions. What is going on? And I guess I had been good. Like most of us are at hiding our symptoms even though we shouldn't do that, but you feel like people don't understand as we all know. So I realized that, you know, me and my wife realized this isn't working anymore. I mean, we were worried I was going to pass out and hit my head somewhere. So it became, I got to work a little bit from home. And like, like Cheyenne said, that's, that's all I can do. You know? It is hard. How about you, Rich? Well, um, yeah, my, my life has been a roller coaster for sure. Uh, for somebody my age, um, as I'm assuming, you know, the rest of the people on this call, um, you know, I, uh, I first became symptomatic in my senior year of high school. And it, as I was figuring things out, I, I went to a university, uh, somewhat close to home and, um, you know, I was actually able to navigate through it all through college, get my degree, four-year degree, start working in Manhattan, um, you know, which was my, really my dream to go to college, start working in Manhattan, start living in Manhattan, and start my life. Um, unfortunately, I never really got to uh, fully live in Manhattan on my own and become independent. Um, after college, once I started the, you know, working in the real world, um, you know, doing the normal, you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday, um, between that commuting, um, just the energy spent every day, uh, it, it caught up to me. My, uh, my efficiency at work, um, I just never felt, um, I never felt, equal to my coworkers. I always felt like I was behind everybody. Um, and eventually like it became where to, it got to the point where they let me go because, um, my efficiency at work just wasn't, um, it wasn't as good as they needed it to be. Um, so after that, it happened. And at also at the same time, uh, you know, I was in a, uh, I was in a, uh, a good relationship at the time um, and with a great girl and um, the frustration, it, it took me years to realize this, but the frustrations of my symptoms and trying to navigate my life kind of, kind of, you know, kind of took things south with the relationship and also with my, again, my job. So um, had to walk away from the relationship and try and also with the job and try and figure more of myself out with my illnesses and my symptoms. And really ever since that time, um, I never took, I was never able to take on a full-time job elsewhere. Um, I've tried other part-time jobs and I tried another full-time job years down the road. Um, but it all ended the same, um, where I was never able to fully take on the responsibilities of the job um, and fulfill them to its highest standards um, without my health getting in the way. Um, so it was always, con it was a constant, you know, um, of my, of my, you know, head hitting the door, if you will, um, just a constant frustration and struggle. Um, and, but with all that uh, along the way, it's, it's matured me, it's humbled me. Um, it's made me empathize with others in ways that I never could have imagined, matured me in ways I never could have imagined. Um, and it wasn't until really two years ago, um, and I know this is a, a subject that we're going to touch on, but um, my mental health 
Uh, I've been dealing with this again. I'm, I'm 31 years old. I started my symptoms around 17, 18. So I've been dealing with this for about 13 years and it didn't, it, it, it didn't take me until two years ago to realize how much it had been affecting my mental health all this time. Um, you know, it was obviously a physical struggle dealing with this all throughout my twenties and, you know, seeing friends of mine prosper, um, you know, with, in beautiful relationships, engagements, marriages, having kids, you know, having going on and having great careers, buying homes, you know, all the things that, you know, people dream of quote, quote unquote for, you know, the American dream. And, and, you know, quite frankly, a lot of people around my age in the twenties, just, they couldn't relate to me. Um, and it was hard to understand really what I was going through. Um, and all that time, again, um, I neglected my mental health. Um, and once I realized that I needed to add that to my repertoire. Um, it allowed me to reach a sense of acceptance, but also not a place of just contentment and numbness because too much contentment, I, I actually got to a place of too much contentment, which then turned to numbness. And, you know, I, you, my therapist really taught me that that's a, you know, that's a bad place to be. You want to be even keel. You want to ride the wave, so to speak. Um, so it's taught me to have a bit more emotional um, resilience in my life. And uh, also has given me a sense of hope as I'm more, a bit more goal oriented now. So but yeah, uh, in terms of my day to day, um, it's it's definitely unpredictable. Um, so I, I try and plan ahead most days um, as best as I can. Uh, if I know I have certain things coming up, um, like Cy, uh, Cyan had said, showering. Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, I used to have no, I didn't really have many issues showering uh, until like maybe a few years back, um, I guess, as like symptoms progressively became more um, uh, pronounced. But yeah, like, fr quite frankly, I'll only shower once or twice a week now. Uh, because and I had this conversation with somebody the other day. Uh, and, and they I had mentioned that and they were like, well, you know, why, why can't you get into a bit of uh, more of a routine of doing it more frequently if you can? I said, honestly, I'd love to. Um, it's just, I usually, if I shower, I usually know the next day is shot. So if I shower more than twice a week, am I wasting, I'm going to be wasting more than two days of my week, you know, being unproductive and stuff. So yeah, I do what I can with that and manage my symptoms as best as I can. But as you all know, it can be pretty unpredictable. Um, and then with like exercise and stuff, um, exercise is tough to do. So it's, it, it definitely affects my day to day, uh, more than I'd like it. So. <laughs> and, and you raised the very important issue of mental health. And I think that when you live with these very physical conditions, it, it goes without saying that your mental health is impacted on varying degrees. And also, as you also touched on the relationships around us, be it our partners, friends, parents, siblings. And, and so Larry, how has this impacted your mental health and, and the relationships of those around you? Well, <clears throat> I would say the biggest and, and kind of like Rich, I noticed all of a sudden that I just wasn't the same anymore mentally. I was, I was numb and I had forced myself into this position, I think is a defense mechanism of, I can't work anymore. Uh, I'm not going out with people. I'm not, I'm not seeing people as much. I had kind of blacked myself off in, in this office <laughs> and this is where I was. And one day, you know, it took my wife who is a nurse to say like, okay, something's up. 
this isn't you. And this has been going on for a while. And I went, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? I, I don't have a job anymore. That, that felt like it was my identity and it was taken away. And I'm like, well, who am I? What, what, what do I do with my life? You know? So I did start seeing a therapist and um, that's the best decision I ever made because he taught me that, you know, your, your job is not your identity. It is a piece of you, you know, and you need to come up with other things. So I put as much energy as I could. It took me a very long time to get my office. You can kind of see it. It's, it's a recording studio where I can work from home and make my own schedule. If I don't feel well, I'm not doing anything. And if I do, I have people come over, we do sessions and stuff. And this has kind of made my life pretty amazing, actually. I, 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 and I know not everybody's going to have the ability to pull something like that off. And I mean, most of the credit goes to my amazing wife who literally led the charge on all this and was like, well, what do I need to do, Mr. Audio Engineer, to make this room work? And I was like, well, we got to buy this and we got to save money and do this. And she was like, okay, we'll figure it out. And, you know, I mean, honestly, I give a lot of the credit to her because she won't let me fall apart, you know? Well, credit to you too. And can't be underestimated that although it makes such a huge difference to have supportive people around you, ultimately it's all down to you and yep. finding that motivation and strength to be able to, to, to move forward. And, and that's amazing. And I noticed also the all important sofa because sometimes you just need to lay flat, right? <laughs> um, and, and sit comfortably. So I get that. And I try and have a, some kind of sofa wherever I'm working. Cause sometimes that is just what you need. Um, Cyan, how about you? So <clears throat> the whole mental health thing has been, uh, a whole journey um, because I was misdiagnosed with mental illness for the majority of my life. You know, being a woman, we're told we're um, hysterical, neurotic, you know. Um, so once all this happened and I got diagnosed, it was sort of like validation, you know, knowing like it wasn't. And yes, I did have some mental health issues before I had an eating disorder as a kid, but knowing that most of my problems didn't stem from, you know, a mental illness kind of validated all my physical symptoms because I was like, am I imagining this? And I always would push myself past the point of breaking, you know, like I would faint after ex exercising too long because I didn't know at the time that I was sick. Um, so it was really validating, but once the validation wore off, it was intense grief. I was really, really going through it. Um, you know, having gone from walking and even being able to run just a little bit at the time to being comp using an electric wheelchair every single day. Um, it was hard. I had just gotten married four months before the complications came from the surgery. And, um, I, we were, my husband and I were planning on having children. Um, and it was really, really hard to realize like this might not happen for us. Um, and the grief has not gone away. I'm only about two years into knowing what's wrong with me health wise. And it's hard to see so many friends and family members having children and buying houses, which has been a huge challenge because of accessibility. And we're now surviving really on one income. So it's been a lot of grief. There, there was a lot of trauma there with medical neglect for all those years and being mistreated. So I have CPTSD from all of the medical trauma and just dealing with people even bullying me in my life who just didn't believe I was sick at the time. So it's been really hard, but I think like someone said, getting a therapist was the best decision I had ever made. I now do therapy two times a week and it really keeps me balanced and it makes me see the bright side to it because you know, had I not gotten sick, I would have not been able to go back to school because I was working so much. So now I'm in college getting a political science degree, which was my dream. I have more time to focus on side activities. I'm a signed model. I get to do co brand collaborations. And these are all things I wanted to do. And I get to set my own schedule now to be able to do it. 
And while the grief doesn't go away and I still have moments where I just break down, especially when I notice my health is getting worse. Um, I still have those moments, but then I'm like, but I'm doing all these other things that I wanted to do. And that kind of keeps me, you know, in a good place. Yeah. I think you just, when you get that diagnosis, there are so many stages on there. It's, it is that relief and gratitude actually, because you've been told it's in your head for so long. And I, I don't think anyone will ever understand the importance of that validation. I'm completely with you on that. Um, when I was diagnosed, I was a photographer and obviously standing for long periods of time, carrying heavy equipment. I knew quite quickly that that wasn't going to be the career for me. And that was what I'd always wanted to do. And it was my health that forced me to, to pivot and adapt and, and, and then grow from that but at that moment you don't know that that could turn into a positive thing I wouldn't be sitting here with you all now and have the career that I do if I hadn't been diagnosed at that point and gone taken myself back to do a second degree study global politics and international relations all of those things that have helped me in this role and helped me get to this place but it's unbelievably scary and although many of us have positive outcomes because we've worked really hard to get those it's not a given. And I think people need to accept that there are changes, there are there is grief, there are plans that you thought in your head were always going to be there that perhaps aren't anymore. And that doesn't mean that good things won't come, but that doesn't take away that that is painful. For, for you, Rich, did you... Um, did, did any of your symptoms cause you to change any of your life ambitions or plans? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I say that with a smile because it's, it's bringing me back to those days of thinking and wishing and wanting. Um, I always, it was my dream to uh, work either for Major League Baseball um, or the New York Yankees in a, in a job where I was either in the, I, I studied public relations uh, and communications at my university. So initially my, my dream was to get in with either the Major League Baseball or New York Yankees uh, PR team or communications team. Um, and really like putting a vision to that role would be like me uh, being, you know, able to be on the field and, and, and doing, you know, media stuff with, you know, said team, um, and, you know, maybe traveling to different ballparks and, or whatever events that major league baseball had going on. Um, so again, it was, you know, those roles, uh, you know, include a very mobile role. Um, and, you know, I, out of college, I, actually had an internship with CBS sports in Manhattan. So I had my foot into the sports industry. Um, and I did meet, uh, a gentleman, uh, from the coincidentally, we had guests that would come in, uh, every weekend to the NFL today, uh, show. Um, and it was one of my responsibilities was to essentially be the, um, um, the caretaker for our guests. And just through networking uh, and, and using my, my networking skills, um, you know, I wound up meeting somebody uh, one day who came in and he was the um, director of communications for Major League Baseball. And I, and, uh, you know, he, he, we were speaking before he even told me that he was asking me like what I, my main interests were and, and what my end goal or where I'd like to take my career. And I, you know, I opened up to him and said, I'd like to be involved with either major league baseball or the New York Yankees in some capacity. And he gave me his business card. Um, and we connected from there. Um, and I stayed in touch with him over the years, um, before I really, you know, made the decision to, uh, you know, focus on my health, but I had parlayed that into, um, multiple job interviews with major league baseball, a job interview with New York, the New York Yankees. Um, though those didn't work out, I don't know if necessarily my health would have held up anyways. 
but however, um, I did have a, a, a job. I did get a job um, through that connection at Major League Baseball in a different capacity. I wound up working at the advanced media office um, and I wound up doing, I, I worked in the broadcasting uh, field. So I, I wound up um, basically cutting highlights and stuff like that. Um, also cutting commercials for live feeds. Um, so I, in a sense, you know, uh, fulfilled some part of that dream in the sense that I, you know, I did at least get my foot in the actual door at major league baseball. Um, but you know, the, the full dream of, of, you know, uh, maybe one day being in the communications team at, at New York, the New York Yankees, um, you know, I, I was doing everything I could to, you know, I was putting all my, um, what's the saying, my ducks in a pond and try, trying to eventually get up to that. Um, and I, I do think if my health issues weren't existent, if I was fully healthy, I for sure by now would have either been working for the Yankees or a different major league team uh, in a different state. Uh, that was my goal. And I think for sure I would have gotten there. Um, but, you know, like you said, you have to pivot you have to adjust. Um, I, I came to a, a sense of, Hey, this is my life. I have to adjust. Um, unfortunately, those dreams uh, can't come to fruition right now, maybe sometime in the future, who knows? Um, but I do think it's important to um, give yourself credit for the things that you had wished you, you once had wished on doing and maybe, you know, considering, well, are there ways I can um, find something else I'm passionate about or something along those same lines that I'm passionate about and contribute in other ways that I may be didn't think of initially, you know, are there, are there other ways that I can offer, um, my, my, my services really. Um, so again, with meeting with a therapist has helped me in that regard and, and saying like, there are other ways that you can contribute or other, um, avenues that you maybe not have realized initially. Um, and similar to your story, like, you know, you pivoted, um, you pivoted a, a different career and now that now you're passionate about that. So I do think, um, although it's a dream that I never really fulfilled fully, um, don't ever close out the idea that there aren't other dreams to be had now that now with this illness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Larry, how about you? So, <clears throat> I, I being from New Orleans, uh, this will make sense. I was, I was supposed to be a touring musician and I did tour. Uh, I had done five tours by the time I was 21. And that was the dream. It's all I ever wanted to be music, music, music. I, I played guitar eight hours a day. Um, and then one day I just couldn't do it anymore. I just, I couldn't play. I started with, you know, cramping up and having issues and and it was hard it I had worked my whole life towards that and it took years to kind of grieve that you know because all I ever wanted I didn't want anything else in life all I wanted to do was be on the road playing music every night and when it became obvious I actually had a doctor say it to me he was like this is not happening he was like there's so much wrong with you. He's like, you're not going to survive eating fast food on the road in a van with a bunch of sweaty, smelly people. That's what he told me. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. He's like, you need to be in a safe environment where you can regulate your intake and your amount of stress and your amount of physicality, you know? And he was right. I didn't want to believe it. I tried to push it further. And that went south. I, it just got to the point where I wasn't happy with the way I was playing on stage. I would go home and be like, oh, I screwed everything up. Like, what am I doing? So one day it just came to like Rich and you said, Laura, I had to pivot. And being an audio engineer, 
is something where I can still be involved in music. I can help other people try and create their vision and I can do it from home. So it was not easy though, because it is hard to help other people try and reach what you were trying to do. But I got to say that, you know, I'm older now, now I'll be 36 next month. I feel like I'm just as happy doing this now as I dreamed about being happy, being a touring musician. So, you know, Rich is right. Don't give up because there's always something you're going to, you know, you can find something and stay close to what you want to do. Maybe not do the exact thing. And I think uh, that's a pretty beautiful thing. Absolutely. I agree. And so we're talking around these autonomic symptoms, but what are they? And, you know, like when, if you had one minute with someone to try and explain your autonomic symptoms to others and what it feels like, how would you do that? Sayan? Oh, man. Um, sometimes I describe it as being really, really, really drunk, like almost blackout drunk when the symptoms are really bad. Um, because if you try to walk, you know, you're kind of falling all over the place. Um, I describe my issues with my oxygen levels as trying to breathe like underwater when it's really bad, like you're breathing air, but it's not doing anything for you. Um, I try to explain whew, the, the tachycardia, like you know, you're running several miles while you're trying to talk or, or brush your hair. And it's like, imagine doing that, you know, while you're doing all these other things. And um, it's still hard for people to grasp that, you know, um, and it's just hard to explain sometimes because you feel so many things at the same time with autonomic dysfunction. It's not just your heart rate. It's not just, you know, that you're blacking out, you know, I get stomach pains. Um, I get blurry vision, headaches, severe nausea, the blacking out, um, shaking, sweating, sometimes not sweating. Um, and you feel so many things at the same time and that can make it really hard <laughs> for me to explain, but it's something else that I say is it's kind of like always having a virus. Like you just always feel sick, um, but it's complicated with, with the racing heart and the oxygen levels and everything else. How would you explain it, Rich? Yeah, I typically keep it as concise as possible. Um, I'll just quickly just go through the, Hey, um, you know, your autonomic nervous system controls things like your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, your digestion. Um, and then from there, from there, I'll just say, you know, I'll get heart palpitations or my heart's racing or my blood pressure fluctuates. It either goes really high or sometimes it drops so low. Um, you know, I say I get like lightheaded. Sometimes like I'll get vertigo um, where the room is spinning. Um, uh, and then like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll mention how I get fatigued really easily. Um, and that like, I'll also, uh, like certain things trigger it randomly. Even I could, even if I'm as best prepared as possible. Um, so generally speaking, uh, people, you know, once I say, once I go through that list, they're like, Oh, wow. I think they realize like how dynamic and complex it, it really is. I remember when I was diagnosed also being surprised by how many things I didn't think were, were impacted. So for example, I've always had problems swallowing dysphagia. Mm -hmm. And when I was diagnosed going there for what I thought was primarily my heart rate and my blood pressure, and then being asked, have you got problems swallowing? And me being like, yeah, like, how is that connected? And really realizing just how many things it impacts. How about you, Larry? How would you explain your symptoms? So I had a friend ask me this question a year ago and um, I told him, you know, it's like when you're on your computer 
and you click on that wrong box and all these pop-up windows start just hitting everywhere. So like the way it starts is I'm walking down the street and uh uh-oh, here comes a GI issue. And I I have no time. I have to find a bathroom and you have no warning. And then you get there and you can't go. And then another window pops up and your heart starts racing. And then another window pops up and you're drenched in sweat and you're trembling. And then another window pops up and you feel like you're going to throw up. And you don't know when this is coming. You don't exactly know all the time what causes it. And you don't know how many symptoms you're going to get hit with in a matter of literally 15 minutes. And they can last all night, all day into the next day. You can have a whole week like this. So when I told him that, he just looked at me and he was like, uh, I just want to give you a hug. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's a perfect description, actually. I think it's interesting as well how people think, oh, well, there must be a consistent trigger for these things. But it can be a, a meal, exercise, or it can just be sitting on the sofa doing nothing. And how do yeah. you predict and plan for that? It's very hard. One thing, you know, we, we've, we've all been living through a global pandemic for the past year or so now. And uh, vaccines um, have come up now. I'm not sure if people here have been vaccinated, but I've had two vaccines now and there we go, very good. Um, And one thing I was surprised about is how much the vaccine impacted my pox. And it was something I hadn't really heard about. Um, From almost 10 minutes after my second vaccine, my heart rate was in the 150s, 160s, and that's with my meds. Uh, my blood pressure was super low. I had all the other things, the fatigue and the things that other people were experiencing. Did any of you experience that? You know, Rich, you show me your arm. So this is recent for you. What, yeah. Did it impact your, your symptoms? Um, in, in short, no. But I did notice after the first vaccine, uh, I want to say either a day or two after, I did notice more frequent, uh, I would describe it as, I guess, arrhythmias, um, where out of nowhere, I would feel my heart, you know, either skip a beat or, or, you know, when your, your heart's, you could just be hanging out doing nothing, your heart is beating at a normal pace, and then all of a sudden just, it kicks out randomly. Um, so that, that I would describe it, it, it was happening and that normally never really happens consistently um, unless something's going on. Um, so that started happening pretty much every day randomly uh, for, I, I want to say about a week or two after the first dose. Um, and then ever since there, like some days I get that, but ever since the second dose, which I've had a, a couple days, no issues. Like I, I didn't, um, I didn't get any immediate reactions, thankfully. I did the first dose get like an immediate uh, sweat. Um, like I, 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 once once she gave it to me, I broke out in a sweat and I thought it was from the vaccine. Um, but the second dose, I was actually anticipating that same thing happening. And I was a bit more calm. You know, I was a bit anxious for the first dose. I'm assuming probably like everyone else. Um, but knowing how my body responded to the first dose saying like, Oh, okay. I was fine. I was pretty much fine. Um, when I went in for the second dose, I was kind of anticipating, you know, breaking out in another sweat or something. And I did experience a little bit of tachycardia, um, not very mild, you know, over a hundred, maybe 110, 120, nothing crazy. Um, nothing I'm not, uh, you know, not used to, um, but I sat there pretty calmly for the second dose and nothing happened. So, um, like I said, just some arrhythmias. Um, and I called my cardiologist, I, you know, I, I had mentioned it and they said, if I, you know, if I have any other newer symptoms or if things get worse to come in, but so far, knock on wood, nothing to really be of concern. That's great. How about you, Sian? Oh, so for me, (laughs) um, I knew I was going in there and it was going to make things worse, (laughs) but I knew if I didn't get it, then that would be a really bad thing. Um, So as soon as I got the injection, my heart rate went up to 197. I started to, you know, the lights, the the lights started going up. (laughs) Um, And then when it started, 
I started to come back, I instantly started crying. And that's something that happens to me because emotions also make my symptoms a million times worse. So <clears throat> that happened. I felt off the entire day. My blood pressure was going crazy. Um, I had more bradycardia and tachycardia than usual. My oxygen levels were dropping more. Um, and then I developed the, a fever the night of the vaccine and I got the Johnson and Johnson. So it was just one and done. Um, and, uh, had a fever for about a day and a half. And when I have fevers, I can't really move because my heart rate's just so high. So, um, even after the fever was gone and I started to feel better, I had headaches for a couple of weeks and, um, ended up having to go to my, um, vascular doctor and make sure I didn't have any type of clots because Johnson and Johnson had that scare, you know, of the rare blood clots, but, um, after about a couple of weeks, I fell back to my baseline and have been good since. Right. What about you, Larry? So uh, I got the Pfizer and um, both times that night, the same night um, that I had received it, um, I was very potsy, like very lightheaded and even more so than usual, I would say. But I, I mean, I was lucky. I would say that it lasted that night and I woke up the next day and I felt fine. You know, I mean, it was, it felt extreme when it was happening, but it was only a couple of hours. Um, you know, just, I kind of just like laid in my recliner and didn't do anything all night to make sure, but you know, even then the symptoms will still come. So I just kind of made sure I had nothing to do and yeah, I was really potsy, but I, I, I think that was really it, you know? Interesting that we've all had a similar experience, though, that it did trigger a pop. So um, be interesting to see that on a kind of wider population. So thinking about treatment and management, there is thankfully treatment out there for POTS um, and it can have varying successes. Rich, are you on any medications? You have management tips that work for you? Uh, yeah, I'm on a beta blocker. Um, I've tried many different uh, beta blockers over the years. Um, and I also tried a bout of fludrocortisone, um, which really negatively affected things. Um, I started... Uh, my first dose of beta blocker was propranolol. Um, and what happened with that was we went, as symptoms kept getting worse, we kept increasing the dosage. Um, but the symptoms never really, um, they, they just continued to become more unmanageable. Um, so at that point, uh, he wanted me, my doc, my cardio to try a different beta blocker. Um, so I've been on a tenol all ever since then. Um, once I, uh, added a autonomic neurologist to my team, um, my chief complaint was, you know, um, fatigue, um, concentration, um, and really the inability to stay upright, uh, for long periods of time. So he wanted to add fludrocortisone thinking. And the way he described it to me was, um, you know, autonomic symptoms. It's like a Venn diagram. Uh, you're going to have one side A, one side B, and we're going to try and meet in the middle and try and get you to where we're treating both and we're in the middle and you have a common ground. So his hypothesis was, all right, well, you're treating your heart rate with the beta blocker, but that's dropping your blood pressure. So let's let's add you to some fludrocortisone. Mind you, ever since the get-go from the beginning, I never really dealt with low blood pressure. It was always high blood pressure. I was more on the hyperadrenergic side of things where it was high heart rate, high blood pressure. So when he put me on the fludrocortisone, you know, I, I read a lot about it and I read a lot of people having success stories with it. So I thought to myself, all right, well, if we're treating with the beta blocker, what's the missing piece? Okay. It's most likely the fludrocortisone or, or something that will keep my, my blood pressure elevated and, and or more stable. And, uh, maybe that will give, 
give me the ability to be more upright and more active and more focused. And well, it took a turn for the worse, but it took a long time for me to really realize how bad it was affecting me. Um, I was on it for a full year. Um, and in the beginning it started out with headaches, but they told me, Oh, that's normal. You know, you'll, you'll get used to it. And I did, I kind of just dealt with the headaches. Um, and the migraines. Mind you, in the beginning, before I ever got started with um, any beta blockers, I dealt with headaches a lot. Migraines, headaches. When they put me on the beta blocker, those subsided for the most part. I get them occasionally, but they weren't as consistent and frequent. When I got put on the fludrocortisone, they came back with a force, more consistent, more frequent. But don't worry, you'll get used to it. And I did. And for about a year, um, I started having insomnia, which I never had. I started having loss of appetite. Also food sensitivities that I never had. Um, and getting back to the doctor and consulting saying, Hey, you know, if this was about a year, um, Hey, my symptoms really aren't getting any better. Um, what can we do? He decided to increase it saying, well, you're not on enough of the medication. Let's increase it. And once we increased it, uh, to instead of taking one pill a day to two pills a day, I lasted about a month before I basically had a hypertensive crisis where I was visiting a friend. I'll never forget. I actually, to be quite frank, I for sure developed, um, uh, you know, PTSD from this day um, where I was visiting a friend in Brooklyn, New York. It was a beautiful day for 4th of July weekend. And he had an apartment on the water and it was, we were supposed to watch the fireworks over, over the Hudson river in um, the river near Manhattan. And um, I had just gotten there and Brooklyn's a very um, high paced, high populated area. And just from getting there in my car and trying to find parking, me turning my head nonstop looking for parking, I started noticing like, just from that, like it being a very overstimulating environment that my autonomics were off because once I started turning my head, I noticed like my vision started getting kind of double vision and I wasn't able to really focus. And I felt as if my autonomics were off and my, maybe my blood pressure was a bit elevated. I met up with my friend and got on my, uh, I had an electric skateboard. I'll never forget. I hopped on that and I lasted one block before my heart rate just went to the highest of highs that I had never experienced. I couldn't walk. I got off of it. He was right beside me, but I found myself lying flat on a Brooklyn sidewalk in probably 90 degree weather um, with my heart rate super high, my blood pressure super high. Um, and the amount of medication, I, I thankfully I had my beta blockers with me um, and I was popping them like candy. Uh, you know, I, I took the first one and usually within 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, my blood pressure, it, it drops, but nothing was helping. And I was just popping them like candy. Realistically, I should have called an ambulance. I should have been admitted to a hospital, but I had been down that road so many times before of being sent to an ER and then being medicated and then being sent home because we all know how it normally ends. So um, I, I assured my friend, I knew what was happening to my body and that, uh, you know, the medications I had would eventually kick in. And um, eventually they did took longer than expected. But um, from that point on, I eventually came off the fludrocortisone and um, uh but at that point, once I came off the fludrocortisone, um, it took me about, I don't know, six months or so. I was pretty bedridden. Um, I was very, I was still in that hyperadrenergic state. Um, and I lost a lot of weight. Uh, you know, I'm 6'2, 165 pounds. And I got down to 130 pounds um, at my sickest. Um, again, it was like I wasn't able to eat much. Um, so the, the steroid really 
didn't do well for me. Um, so for now, I'm just on a beta blocker. But with that, it's pros and cons too. Um, like if I take it, great. It keeps my heart rate down, keeps my blood pressure down. But um, there are also days where I'm like super fatigued from it. I can't focus. Uh, I don't have much energy to do stuff. So if I, if I don't take it, you know, I'll feel more energetic, but then I know a crash is coming. So it's, I know with most medications, it's pros and cons to everything. So, but that's how I manage right now. It's just a beta blocker. Um, a lot of, lots of water, lots of, um, normal light packets, um, and kind of monitoring my sleep as best as I can and my diet as best as I can and really my activities as a whole. So it's a lot of, a lot of planning ahead. Um, but yeah, and it's ongoing, you know, I see my specialists every three months and, um, I'm always seeing other doctors for other things as you all could relate to, I'm sure. So, um, but yeah, for day to day, just a beta blocker for now in terms of uh, pharmaceutical treatment. How about you, Sian? Um, so I've tried a lot of different medications, beta blockers. I've taken mestinone, um, Corlinor, um, and I had, unfortunately, uh, the doctor said I have hypersympathetic nervous system discharge. So I react very intensely to, uh, my nervous system reacts very intensely, intensely to these medications. So the Corlinor was dropping me into the thirties, my heart rate into the thirties, because I also have bradycardia. And then if I would try to combat that by moving, then it was going, then I would get tachycardia instead of going somewhere in the middle. Um, the mestinone was just making me really sick. There was another one that I just tried that I can't remember the name of, but it was making my blood pressure way too high. So couldn't take that one anymore. Um, I'm doing uh, saline infusions, but you know, it's not really a POTS thing. So that's not doing anything. It helps a little bit as far as energy and stuff like that, but it doesn't do anything for like the real severe symptoms. And um, we are currently fighting for IVIG immunoglobulin um, infusions and it's been denied now three times and I'm having my third appeal today where I'm giving my testimony to my insurance company to try and get this treatment um, without it things are probably going to get worse and they have gotten a little bit worse um, and this is pretty much like the gold star treatment for autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy but since the conditions only, you know, it's a hundred cases of it a year is extremely rare. My insurance company doesn't want to cover it because it's considered experimental. And that might be the only thing that I have left to try because I've tried everything else. You know, I've done salt and all these other things that everyone keeps telling me to try. And right now we're just trying to do symptom management. So I take a lot of nausea medicine <laughs> every day. Um, I take steroids because I have low cortisol, um, the oxygen for the, you know, oxygen issues, we really haven't found anything that has been effective because I've got this condition where they said I have a phenotype that the person who was studying it actually died from COVID. So there's not much information <laughs> about the phenotype or um, the immune system processing that I have. Um, so it can be really discouraging because I always feel like the one thing I, that can help me, I can't get because I live in America and um, health insurance corporations are in charge of whether or not you can get a treatment. So it's been scary. Um, I'm trying not to lose hope, but, you know, just doing the best that I can and, and really hoping that the testimony I give to my insurance today is enough. You know, I kind of hoped that the test results and everything were enough, but that doesn't matter to them. So just hoping they have a heart and can hear, you know, my story and what I'm going through. Good luck with that. Thank you. Um, Larry, how about you? So um, I am not at the current moment able to take any medication for my autonomic issues. And it's because I am on so much medication for the ehlers downloads and now I'm newly diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Uh, so 
my, my prescriptions went through the roof when I got the muscular dystrophy diagnosis. So now what I am doing are all things on my own to try and help. And this is what I've done. I did buy, and this did take some time to save the money. I bought a adjustable frame for my bed for the head and the feet. And that has made such a difference. You know, it, it's, it's something that now when I get up in the morning, it is easier to get up. Um, and I have found like the perfect height for me, you know, um, but that's definitely helping with my pot symptoms. Um, I have added a good amount of, uh, salt to my diet, although now I have to take Lipitor cause I went a little overboard. So my cholesterol got really high. So no one do that. Don't learn from my mistakes. Uh, don't eat fried chicken every day because it makes you feel better. Uh, cause that's what I did. Um, they also, my doctors, my team has really theorized for a long time that one thing that exacerbates my symptoms is that I have been extremely underweight my whole life. And I mean, as an adult, I had never weighed more than 115 pounds. So they thought that raising my weight would help to raise my blood pressure. And we have had success with that. I've gained 26 pounds this year and uh, it's been hard. I got to eat six meals a day. Uh, to pull it off. Um, but when my weight gain went up, my symptoms have gotten better. So I'm basically trying to use a lot of the information I get off the Ellers Downloads website and talking with other patients, but I can't add any medication. I'm just, I'm at the top right now. And they were like nothing. And they even had to take some things away to add new things. And they were like, we got to do this the, as natural as possible. So the bed frame, um, adding salt, but within reason, and, uh, and, um, uh, weight gain has helped. It really has. I think for me, one of the biggest things that helps me is the electrolytes and you think, um, drinking lots of water, but sometimes it can be too much water and not enough electrolytes. And that's taken me a really long time to realize that and what, what kind of magic mix is. So we've been talking for almost an hour now and I could talk to you all for hours more, but to conclude, if in just a sentence or two for you, what difference would awareness and, and understanding of autonomic dysfunction mean to you? We'll start with Rich. Um, it's definitely gotten better over the years. I know you touched on that earlier. Um, I would just like to see doctors that are in the field that are accessible, you know, for everybody, um, for them to even become more involved and educated, um, uh, I had one of my, I had my autonomic neurologist told me once, and he's a sarcastic guy, but I know that there was some truth behind it when he said it. Um, he had told me, you know, you really are lab rats with all of this. And I, I come from a very sarcastic, jokeful, like, that's my personality, but and I know he does too. So we both laughed it up. But when I got back to my car, I realized there was truth behind that and that he, he truly thinks that. Um, so it's tough to hear that from a guy who um, is an autonomic neurologist himself and is involved. Um, I know it's, t I know it's a territory that is still being investigated and researched. Um, so maybe doctors aren't at fault in that regard. Maybe we are still behind in some regard. Um, but I would just like to see, like you said, more change, more awareness. And we, as a patient community, we truly do need all the help um, as possible in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think education and more 
medical experts has got to be up there on my list as well, for sure. How about you, Cyan? My hope for with awareness is that that would lead to more research. You know, I think if there's an interest that maybe we could research these conditions more and then with more research can come more treatments possibly. And, you know, this might be a stretch, but maybe even a cure for some of these types of dysautonomias. Um, I also just hope that it creates understanding within the community, you know, people who don't have this, because I spent so many years where I looked okay, you know, I looked okay. And people really judge the way you look and determine if how sick you are. Um, and I just want people to understand that all of this is internal for probably most people like you don't see this stuff what's going on inside and we're so good at hiding it like I just wish there was more representation of these conditions even in like the media you know I would like to see celebrities talking about it I've seen a couple but not very many um, and that might make people be a little bit more empathetic <laughs> towards these types of invisible conditions yeah absolutely how about you Larry for me um I agree with both Rich and Cyan. I mean, the issue for me is that I, I think we need the stigma of when you go to a doctor and they don't know what's wrong with you, we need that to be gone. We need like the, the future doctors, medical students now to be taught about this illness because there's still this, and I hear this every day from patients, other patients I speak with, you know, there is still the stigma of your drug seeking Oh, you're, you're on drugs. That's why you're sweating all the time and dizzy. I mean, this is, you're drunk, you know, I mean, I was accused of that. And, and, you know, that really puts people in a position to never look for help again. I mean, that crushes you when you, you go to a doctor, when you are at your worst and when you need help and when somebody just takes you and goes, I don't believe you. It is so damaging mentally and physically, and then people will not seek help. So I really just want these stigmas to go away. And I want, I want the world to understand, just like Cyan and Rich said, sometimes you can't see what's wrong with someone, but we need to believe them, you know? I think believing is just so important and something that's not considered enough. You know, we think about all those so important things, you know, education, research, awareness, but the basics of even friends and family believing what you're going through and understanding it with, with all, I think shared a similar experience in at some point in our lives, doctors or people disbelieving because it's not, you can't see it. You can't understand it. You can't fathom how sporadic it can be. You were okay yesterday and you're not today. I can't see what's wrong. I can't see your pain. So it's not real. And that has, that causes so much damage, so much damage. And, and also, PTSD, you know, you touched on that, Rich, that we spent so long not being believed that then we have this kind of reaction and this, this feeling like even when people are believing you, that you're still not being believed because of all of that that you've had for so many years not being believed. And it just sets you up in a place where it's really, really hard to move on from that point. And, and I've definitely, I've, most of my life up until the age of 24, you know, hypochondriac, it's in your head. When I was finally diagnosed with my POTS, I was in hospital with getting over my infection. And every time I stood up, my heart rate would go up and my blood pressure would drop. And they said, we think you're just anxious about going home. I was like, I am so excited to go home. I like, the only thing that makes me anxious is the thought of staying here and none of you knowing why my heart is doing what it's doing. And it's still, even though it's veiled in, oh, I think it's anxiety or I think it's, it's still, we don't believe that there's something wrong. And the damage that that causes to then be, you know, I literally was discharged and then readmitted to another hospital under a team that knew exactly what it was. And the validation and the tests and the answers to all those questions meant more than I think anyone will ever know. And I, I think everyone here can relate to that, but I completely, that, that's my hope, you know, being believed, being validated, getting that diagnosis and absolutely saying we can all hope for a cure. I think why shouldn't we? You know, I think we all deserve no less. 
But thank you all so much for your time, for sharing your stories, your experiences. I wish you all such strength and hope for, for everything that you're doing, for your new dreams, new ambitions, and I wish you nothing but success in all of it. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you.